here to talk about SGLT2's inhibitors and how they will actually replace the primacy of DPP4 inhibitors. I'll start with a quotation of Tennyson which says, The old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. And when we are comparing two drugs, there are certain criteria by which you compare drug A versus drug B. These are the points that I'm going to go by. I'm going to skip that because of paucity of time, but I'm going to go through each of them individually. And the kind of data that I'm going to use in most of the situation is going to be head-to-head -head trials. There's no point comparing apples with oranges in two different studies. Meta-analysis and standalone studies in very few situations where there are no head-to-head -head trials. And if I actually had to appraise the entire data, I think this would have been a debate for two hours because I have enough material to go on till dawn. So let's start with monotherapy of the flozins. If you compare monotherapy of type 2 diabetes, flozin versus the gliptins, this first trial of empagliflozin categorically shows that as far as HPA1C is concerned, blood glucose lowering is concerned, as far as weight is concerned, and as far as blood pressure lowering is concerned, empagliflozin wins hands up. Similarly, you have a study of canagliflozin comparing with citagliptin showing similar results. When you talk about as an add-on therapy, so a patient of type 2 diabetes is already on metformin, you're now trying to compare two groups, one group on gliptin and one group on flozin. You have this CANA study, which is already three years old, which shows that canagliflozin 300 milligram does better than citagliptin and in terms of glycemic control. And if you look at weight reduction, citagliptin is nowhere near canagli canagliflozin in terms of weight reduction. Similarly, this is a trial of empagliflozin as an add-on therapy compared with citagliptin, which shows EMPA does better than uh, CETA in terms of blood glucose lowering as an add-on to metformin therapy. Only lately, another study has been published showing, comparing Saxa versus DAPA, where again, DAPA does better than saxagliptin. Now, what about a situation where a patient is already on metformin and sulfonylurea? You are now trying to add a third agent. How does a gliptin and a furlosin compare? Here again, canagliflozin wins clearly over citagliptin in terms of glycemic control as well as weight reduction. The one major point that we have to all think about is durability of glycemic control because type 2 diabetes is a situation where the beta cell function is going to go on declining over a period of time. And one of the major things that is important about the SGLT2 inhibitors is that the action is independent of the level of insulin secretion capability of the body. So that is going to be one major reason why if you look at long-term studies, say this is CANA versus CETA, you see the graphs widening as time goes. The CETA starts failing and the canagli flows in still keeps on doing its job. This is again from that same study looking at the fasting sugar and the postprandial glucose levels. And this is a one and a half year old study comparing empagliflozin with cetagliptin, where here, as you can see, look at the weight difference, look at the blood glucose difference, cetagliptin is nowhere near the effect of, of empagliflozin. The other thing that you have to think of is lipids. Now, most of the studies show that the HDL levels are raised by all of the SGLT2 inhibitors. The results with the LDL is variable. What is important is that the LDL is to HDL ratio remains unaltered. That is what is important in terms of cardiovascular risk. This is a summary slide of what happens to all the lipid parameters with all the gliflozins. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors does all that a DPV4 does and does even more. This particular trial, if you look at, it increases GLP-1 levels. So you're using a DPP-4 inhibitor. The SGLT2 is going to do that for you anyway. And let us look at a situation where flozins work even when the gliptins have failed. If you look at this particular trial, individuals who did not respond to linagliptin, if you added something like empagliflozin 25 milligram, it still worked. Whereas if somebody was already on a, a flozin, if you add an additional gliptin, the addition is only additive and nothing more than that. So in situations where the gliptin is going to fail, the linagliptin is not working, you've added empagliflozin, the drug is still working. What about glycemic variability? Sorry. This was something which was being discussed in the previous session. Where better do you test glycemic variability than type 1 diabetes? This is where person has highest glycemic variability. And this study categorically shows that dabagliflozin reduces glycemic variability even after adjustment of reduction of insulin dosage. So this categorically shows that it's a great drug in terms of reduction of glycemic variability. So the summary of this part of the story as of now, 
in terms of all the parameters of glycemic control, flozins far superior than gliptins. What about weight? The weight loss is to the tune of 2.5 to 3 kilograms. So I can think of it as an anti-obesity drug, not just an anti-diabetic medication. It is as good as all listat in Zendos. It is as good as all of the GLP-1 analogs in the diabetes trials. What about blood pressure reduction? Everybody says, you know, it's a very small amount of blood pressure reduction. It's the same as what you found with Ramipril in Hope. It is the same as perindopril in in advanced trial. So this drug is good enough on its own to be an anti-hypertensive drug in type 2 diabetic patients. So why not call it a polypill? You have one pill which has anti-diabetic, anti-weight loss, it causes weight loss and also blood pressure lowering. Use in different situations. Well, this is one thing which was being discussed in the previous talk, you know, that if the EGFR goes down too low, you will not be able to use this drug because it is not going to work. What proportion of patients will not respond? That red dot there is the only proportion of patients where you cannot use the drug. This is the total number of renal function parameter of all patients, diabetics or non-diabetic. So just for that one proportion where it might not work, there is no point in saying that the drug is not good enough. And if you are using it even in the worst of situations of renal function, it does not alter renal function. And there are now trials even in the range of 30 to 60. So I am hopeful with the trials that are going on, EMPA will have a license lowered from 45 to 30 in the near future. What about liver dysfunction? Mild and moderate liver dysfunction, you can use all of them. In severe, you can use a lower dose of dapagliflozin. What about use in elderly? Very few anti-diabetic medication have trials where you are using drug up to the age of 75 years and 85 years. That is safe for most of our elderly patients. What about quality of life? Look at this head-to-head -head trial of SGLT2 versus DPP-4 inhibitors in terms of quality of life. At the beginning of the trial, the quality of life was in favor of the cetagliptin. At the end of the trial, it was in favor of canagliflozin. So it wasn't that it was on a level playing ground. It still did better than canagliflozin. Canagliflozin did much better than cetagliptin. What about cost effectiveness? There is a direct study of canagliflozin versus cetagliptin looking at the cost effectiveness and there is a saving. Now, Let's forget about that. Let's look at it in a different way. This is a polypill. So if you have to fight canagliflozin in 51 rupees, you'll have to think of cetagliptin, two tablets of Olistat and two tablets of Ramipril, which is more cost effective for your patient with type 2 diabetes. What about CV safety? Well, there are problems with the heart and gliptins. If you look at all the trials, there is heart failure with the gliptins. And what is more surprising in this study, look at the HB1C reduction in both of those trials, SAVAR and examine. 0.2% with the gliptin, 0.36%, the regulatory authorities would not have even approved the drug as an anti-diabetic medication. Forget about the debate. What about CV safety of the SGLT2 molecules? Here you have a drug which is addressing the blood glucose, the weight and the blood pressure. The, it is addressing the most important factors of modification of cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes, which this other drug does not do. And therefore, not surprisingly, the MACE data is, looks very promising and hopefully when the long-term trials come out, it is going to do great. In terms of safety, this is a comparison of all the safety data and side effects, gliptin versus flozin. Clearly, there is no difference between the two groups. And individually, if you look at hypoglycemia rates, there is no difference, but SGLT2 does not interfere with the glucagon. Therefore, the response to hypoglycemia is going to be preserved in SGLT2, not preserved with DPP-4 inhibitors. There is noise and smoke about pancreatitis and pancreatic malignancy with the gliptins. What about infection? We all talk about there is possibly going to be increased genital urinary tract infection. Asian data clearly shows the data is very different from our western counterpart. Why is that? Because whether we like it or not, hand hygiene might not be that great in Asians, but genital hygiene in Indians is far better than our western counterparts. What about a summary of the infection of DPP-4 inhibitors? The DPP-4 inhibitors are also associated with infection. Look at this trial of empagliflozin with cetagliptin. There is no difference in urinary tract infection rates between the two drugs. There is too much of hype about UTIs. Cancers, it was blamed for bladder cancer and breast cancer. We know it is essentially all, most of the malignancies occurred within the first year of the drug trial itself. So the drug cannot be implicated for malignancies. So it is more of a hype. Laboratory data like diselectrolytemia, hypotension, not major issues. You have to use the usual caution. Bone health, dapagliflozin does not increase fracture rate. Non-canvas data, canagliflozin does not increase fracture rate. DPP-4 inhibitors, there are studies to show that some of them increase fracture rate. Overall, no effect. It is therefore not surprising that this drug has 
in such a short span of time got the attention of the ADA ESD guideline and taken the place of prominence that it deserves. So I've looked at all of those parameters that I've shown, the ones in red, the, DP, the SGLT2 is a clear winner over the other competitor and the ones in black are the ones where it is neutral. And therefore, it's not surprising that Ferrarini in his article said that the new kid on the block, that is the SGLT2 inhibitors, blocks the, beats the teenager, that's the gliptins. So SGLT2 were the agents of choice in this decade, just as the DPP4 were in the last decade. Clearly, the flozins are winner. And finally, I will say, as far as flozins are concerned, let me put it, this feud to rest, flozins the best. Thank you very much.